video we'll be looking at an overview of uh, preventing and treating diseases. So um, there are mainly two things to think about, which is first of all vaccines as a prevention, and then the second thing is about uh, drugs as treating diseases, and uh, you need to know some examples of them, the types of them, and also how do we do drug trials. For those of you who are doing um, separate sciences, uh, then you will also need to know about monoclonal antibodies, which is another way of um, uh, another way to deal with diseases, as in treatment and diagnosis as well. So these are a few things we're going to talk about. We're going to start with vaccines. So vaccines are uh, dead or inactive pathogens that get uh, injected into the body. So um, we say it has to be dead or inactive because otherwise, if you just inject pathogens in the body, it will just trigger an immune response, which is what you get if you're sick anyways. So um, with a vaccine, it's a safe way um, where you are injecting these dead or inactive pathogens to make the body or make the immune system um, uh, to produce something called memory cells. Now these memory cells are very important because they are the ones that are able to recognize the same pathogen if it, it actually invades the body. So the way to look at this is uh, by looking at the shape of this graph. This is time on the x-axis and then on the y-axis we have antibody concentration. So let's say in the beginning that's your, the vaccination or your first encounter with the pathogen. Now in the beginning there will be a slow response, so there won't be much antibodies being made. Um, and if they're made, they're made eventually, not immediately. So there's a bit of a delay in the timing there. And um, as time goes on, very quickly, so the antibodies that are made will actually be destroyed soon and then therefore the concentration goes back down. So it stays low. However, because of the first encounter of the vaccination, you have produced the memory cells. So therefore, let's say we leave it for a bit and then you get the actual infection. So the real infection occurs there at this point in time. Because the memory cells are there, they are able to immediately bind to the antigens of the pathogen and recognize that it's there. And then it's th therefore able to produce high concentrations of antibodies in a very short amount of time. And not only that, the antibodies don't get destroyed and they stay in the bloodstream for a little bit longer. So the benefit of having the vaccination is that you have the memory cells recognizing the pathogen if it invades again and very quickly produce high concentrations of antibody in a very short amount of time. Notice of two things, you need to mention that it's a much higher concentration of antibody compared to the one before and it's happening in a short amount of time compared to before and that's the benefit of um, having the vaccinations there. Not only that, if we've got a high amount of people who got vaccinated, uh, so let's say about 90% of the population uh, are vaccinated, uh, we reach something called herd immunity. So the benefits of uh, having herd, reaching herd immunity is that uh, because most of the population have already been vaccinated and have the memory cells, you are slowing down the spread of the pathogen or even to stop it completely. Because even though, um, you know, because most people are vaccinated, if someone is not vaccinated for whatever reason, they are less likely to actually um, get the pathogen from those that are vaccinated because they're able to kill the pathogen in their body before transmitting it. So therefore having lots and lots of people or high amounts, uh, high proportion of a population to be vaccinated will reach herd immunity, which slows down the spread of diseases. So vac vaccinations are a well-tried and practiced method to slow down or to even stop the spread of uh, infections and pathogens. However, in the case of, um, let's say vaccinations didn't work properly, or you, someone didn't get vaccinated, or someone gets ill anyways, um, then we need to use uh, medicines or drugs to treat that uh, disease. So there will be three things that we're gonna look at. So we're going to first of all look at that, uh, the two different types of drugs. So one type of drug would be painkillers. Now painkillers, as the name implies, uh, kill the pain, or we say it deals with the symptoms only. It only treats the symptoms for, let's say, headaches or fevers, etc. But it does not kill the pathogens. So it's really important to remember it only deals with the symptoms. Keyword here is only. So you have to say the word only. Another type of uh, drug that we'll talk about is antibiotics. Now in the case of antibiotics, it's a little bit different. They are actually drugs that are able to kill bacteria 
only. So if you've got a um, viral infection or if you're dealing with fungi or protists, you cannot use antibiotics uh, because antibiotics will target specific parts of the bacteria instead of anything else. So for example, they're able to uh, break the cell wall of the bacteria. Uh, they're able to uh, inhibit uh, enzymes that work inside bacteria and stops them from reproducing. So it only works on bacteria and nothing else. So it's very important that uh, when when thinking of how to treat certain uh, infections, um, we need to be careful in terms of what type of drug we use. And obviously we might have heard of this is any overuse of uh, antibiotics or misuse of that could lead to resistance of the um, of antibiotics uh, from the bacteria. So we use the word resistance when it is about bacteria or pathogens that are not being killed by the antibiotic or by the drug that we're using. Whereas the word immunity is used for animals, plants that are not being infected. So we need to be careful in terms of the use of the words and obviously be aware of how can we deal with uh, the use of antibiotics. And you'll learn more about this as well uh, in, in later on in the course. So these are two types of drugs. So next up, we're gonna look at three examples of medicines that you need to be aware of. You need to know what they are and also the origins of these drugs. So there are three drugs. The first one is Digitalis. Now, Digitalis is a medicine that is used to treat uh, heart diseases. And it actually comes from a, uh, uh, from a plant called foxgloves. Now, foxgloves are quite, can be quite common in um, the UK. Um, and uh, the idea is that people might know foxgloves are toxic, but again, it's about the dosage of it and how we use it that we can potentially turn it into something useful in the case of, in this case, it would digitalis for heart conditions. Another one that you may have heard of before is aspirin. So aspirin is a painkiller uh, that, uh, that can be used to deal with the symptoms only, and it comes from willow tree bark. And the third one is a very famous medicine, which is penicillin. So penicillin is an antibiotic and it was uh, first discovered by Fleming or Alexander Fleming, and it comes from a fungi. Key thing to be aware of uh, in the case of penicillin is you may be asked to name the scientists who were involved in the discovery and development of penicillin. So make sure you know this one. So first of all, it's Fleming. So Alexander Fleming is the person who first discovered the penicillin. Um, itself, but he didn't manage to mass produce it or develop it. It was of uh, two other scientists uh, called Flory and Chain. Uh, these two scientists are the ones who further did drug trials to um, develop the actual drug penicillin and then mass produced it working with Pfizer, which is the pharmaceutical company um, uh, in time for um, the world wars. Um, so these are the two, uh, three scientists that you need to be aware of when it comes to development and discovery of penicillin. So finally, we're gonna look at drug trials. So um, any medicine that we are using nowadays or vaccines that we're using nowadays uh, must go through a rigorous process of drug trials. Um, so they go through stages of testing um, before it can actually be released and used uh, for the public. So there are four key things that they test for, which is, first of all, efficacy, whether a drug works or not. So does it actually help with, uh, let's say, if it's a painkiller, does it actually deal with the symptoms, deal with the pain, or if it's an antibiotic, does it actually kill the bacteria that you're aiming for? Uh, another thing they test for is toxicity. So, so toxicity is referring to if a drug will actually make uh, a person sick. Does it kill healthy cells uh, in the body in, in the process of that? And does it actually cause someone to be seriously ill? And obviously if a drug is tested to be toxic, then um, it will not be used or only used as a very, very last resort. Third thing they test for will be side effects. So this is different to toxicity. Uh, toxicity is if it if it's talk about if the drug will actually kill a lot of the healthy cells, where side effects would be less severe or less serious. So the idea is that you can still use the drug; it's safe to use. However, you may have some unwanted secondary effects that um, that that you don't really want to go along with the actual symptoms. So uh, they're unwanted, but they are not necessarily uh, serious enough for us to stop using the drug. Then the fourth uh, thing that we test for will be dosage, which is about the concentration uh, of the drug, or the volume of the drug that we should use because too low of a dosage, the drug will not work. Too high of a dosage, it might cause health problems uh, for the patient who's taking it. So for drug trials, they'll be testing for these four things. Now, when it comes to the drug trials, there are four stages, but we can largely put them into two groups. 
So we can have preclinical trials and clinical trials. So preclinical refers to anything that uh, happens inside a lab, whereas clinical trials are the test that happens in a clinic or in a hospital. So this is done on human, these are done on human beings. Preclinical trials are not on actual living human beings. So the first step after discovery of the drug and doing some computer modeling, the first thing we do is we test the drugs on cells, tissues, and organs. So the idea is that with the cells, tissues, and organs, you're not harming an individual. So you can see if uh, the main thing we'll be testing for efficacy, does the drug actually work uh, to do what we expect it to do? Once we see that the drug actually works, or we se selected a few of these chemicals that do work, then we will test it on smaller animals uh, inside the lab. So for example, mice. So the idea is that we are using an animal model to uh, simulate, let's say, how it would work in terms of um, if we use it on an animal instead of using it on a human being. Uh, testing for toxicity and perhaps estimating a possible dosage that we could use uh, on a human so we can do a calculation to work out okay roughly how much should we put on human beings to see if it works or not and at that stage we get an idea of having several chemicals that does deal with the symptoms that we're looking for uh, it's not uh, severely toxic and we've got a rough idea of the dosage then we can move on to the clinical trials and the first stage of that one is testing it on healthy individuals so that you can see if there are any side effects that come from taking the drug. So we are not testing it immediately on patients because what if the side effects are so severe that the patients can't take it? So we test on healthy volunteers first. It's really important to remember at this stage, we will not be testing for efficacy because these healthy volunteers do not have the target uh, symptoms that we're looking for. So there's no point in looking for efficacy in this stage. So we'll be mainly focusing on side effects uh, in, in this situation. And at that point, if the side effects are uh, either non-existent or minimal, then we can move on to the final stage here, which is testing on patient volunteers. So these are people who are patients. They are the ones who have the symptoms and they volunteer to actually test the drug. And then at this point, we'll be testing for efficacy uh, and, then, uh, finding, and then use them to find out the optimum dosage. What's the best possible concentration to use on these patients um, in the commercial situation? A key thing to remember as well is in the case of clinical trials, we are doing something called a double blind trial. Now, when you're testing the drug, you want to look for efficacy, uh, testing for efficacy, etc. But um, it's really important that we put, give some of the volunteers the actual medicine and the other half of the, uh, of the volunteers, we give them the placebo, which is a fake drug. Now, the placebo will look the same, taste the same, smell the same. So everything looks on, on the outside looks the same as the real drug. Sometimes the doctors and nurses or the researchers will be looking for evidence to prove that the drug is working or not. And so they'll be looking for things which is biased and we don't want that in a fair trial. So in the case of clinical trials, we'll be doing a double blind trial where uh, the patients that are taking the drug and the doctors and nurses administrating the drug will not know who gets the placebo and who gets the real drug. They get given a drug and then they will do the measurements um, around it and take the data around it, but they will not know who got the real thing and who, has it, who hasn't. So this is about ensuring there's fairness in the trial and to reduce the effects of bias from the researchers. Now, in the case of drug trials, um, it can be usually a four to even six marker question where they will ask you to design a drug trial to talk about the four stages of drug trials, as I've listed out here, and the purpose of each step. So the four things they're testing for, make sure you know which each stage is testing for what. Uh, and then they will ask you to also mention how do you make it a fair trial? How do you make a fair test? So then you need to mention the double blind trial, the placebo and other control variables that you need to keep the same things like the age, uh, gender, health conditions, diet, etc. Uh, so it's about how do you make a fair test, which is your usual practical experimental um, skills. If you're doing the combined sciences, then what you need to know from this chapter is these, these, these things here. So we've got vaccines and talk about what are vaccines and what they do and the importance of the memory cells recognizing the pathogen and producing high concentrations of antibodies in a very short amount of time. 
Whereas on the drugs, you need to know the two types of drugs and what they do, the three examples of drugs and the origins, and also the four stages of drug trials and how to make sure it's a fair drug trial. Now, if you're studying separate sciences or would like to know more, then keep watching this video and then we're going to look at uh, monoclonal antibodies. So monoclonal antibodies are actually something that is very, very useful um, in our everyday life. Um, and a lot of the times we might be using it without realizing it. So the word mono means one, clono obviously means cloning. So these are antibodies that are made from one cloned cell. So we can use it in different things. So in terms of uses, one of the most common things that we use it for is pregnancy tests. Now in pregnancy tests, the idea is that we are releasing a hormone called HCG. For pregnant women um, and that is something that we can test using the pregnancy test here um, and it's about using these monoclonal antibodies we actually use the same concept uh, use the same method for the lateral flow test when uh, during the COVID pandemic we use pretty much the same principles as the pregnancy test which is using monoclonal antibodies except that the antibodies are designed to be recognizing the COVID of coronavirus antigen instead of the HCG hormone in pregnant women. Another thing that we can use monoclonal antibodies for will be cancer diagnosis and also potentially uh, targeted treatment. So we can actually design the antibody to recognize the um, cancer cell antigen and then attach a chemotherapy drug onto the antibody and it will deliver that specific chemotherapy drug to the cancer cells so it stops it from destroying any other healthy cells. Um, so it's actually a very, very powerful thing that we can use this for. These antibodies can also be used in loads of different things like drug um, testing. So in the case of um, testing for in, in the Olympics or any major sporting um, competition, you might be testing for performance enhancing drugs. So you can use this in the blood test and the urine test. Uh, you can use antibodies, these antibodies for um, testing for illegal drugs in, in forensics and uh, police investigations. So the idea is that these antibodies are designed to recognize very specific chemicals or cells that we want them to recognize instead of just any, any antibodies that our body has made to target pathogens. We can actually make them target specific chemicals. They like to ask you to explain how monoclonal antibodies are made. That is usually a four to five marker question. So the first step in making these monoclonal antibodies is to infect the mouse with the pathogen that you want to target. The idea is that you're triggering an immune response and the mouse would then start to produce white blood cells that make antibodies. So the white blood cells that make the antibodies are called um, lymphocytes. So this is a lymphocyte here. So we would then the second step is to extract the specific lymphocyte. So the re idea of specific means that you're having the lymphocytes that can produce specific antibodies to the thing that you're trying to test for. So once you extracted it, you might want to test it as well to make sure that, okay, this lymphocyte is actually making the antibody that you want. To speed things up, we want to make sure that they are able to make lots and lots of uh, antibodies in a very short amount of time. So therefore, we need to give it the ability to uh, divide itself very quickly uh, so that we can make more of this specific lymphocyte. So therefore, we fuse it with a cancer cell or a tumor cell. So at this point, we will produce something that looks like this, which is the idea of having a cell that is able to make the specific antibodies that you want, but also have the ability to divide very, very quickly to make lots and lots of them. So now at this point, we've got this product which is called a hybridoma. So the next step for mass production is that we would need to allow the hybridoma to clone itself very quickly. And therefore all of these hybridoma cells can all make these specific antibodies that you want. And then what you do is that you collect and purify uh, these antibodies to so basically the, the idea is that you're not injecting or using the hybridoma cells. You're just using these specific antibodies that you want. So in terms of where the marks would be, so it's literally the, these few steps. So number one, you infect the mouse or inject the mouse with the specific pathogen that you want. Then you extract the specific lymphocytes that um, makes the specific antibodies. You test to check to make sure that you've got the lymphocytes that do actually make the antibody. And after that, you would fuse those lymphocytes with a cancer cell to make a hybridoma cell. Um, and this hybridoma cell is then cloned uh, with you, you incubate it and you clone it to make lots and lots of hybridoma cells and then they all start producing the 
monoclonal antibodies and you collect and purify them so that they can be used. As I mentioned before, this will be a four to five marker question, which can be relatively easy to get once you make sure you know the different steps in between. So final thing is to look at how pregnancy tests work. So in a pregnant woman, they would produce a hormone called X HCG. And this is uh, released through urine and we say test it in the morning when it's at its highest concentration. So you pee into the wick here and then the urine will get soaked up and it will move up the pregnancy test. Uh, and it will, uh, re will go through two particular windows. We've got the test window here uh, and we've got the control window there. So there are a few components that you need to be aware of. First of all is um, inside the test uh, strip here, you will have these free floating uh, monoclonal antibodies. So the monoclonal antibody is this actually this Y shaped thing over here. Now, um, some of them will be freely floating in the, uh, in the test and these free floating uh, monoclonal antibodies will have a dye attached to it. Now, let's say in this case it's a red dye, which will only be activated um, if it binds to an XCG molecule uh, and, it's, uh, and it's bound to a specific area. So if it's just there, it doesn't appear red at all. And on the other hand, we also got these monoclonal antibodies that are fixed onto the test strip. So they're there to recognize specifically XGG. So you can see a complementary shape here. So you've got the circular XGG. So you've got a circular complementary shape of the antibody there. Now in the test area, in the test window, you will get these, um, these chemicals attached. Now these chemicals are not uh, necessarily hormones, but they have a very similar shape to XGG. So you can see it's also a circle here. So they are there to mimic the presence of XGG which means that these monoclonal antibodies should attach onto the uh, test window here, whether the XGG is present or not. So the idea is to test to say if you would see, you should see a strip here to appear because it's to say, uh, it's to show that the test is working properly. We do have monoclonal antibodies to, um, to, to test for the presence of XGG. So let's say uh, a woman has peed on that and then it's moving up. And what happens would be, first of all, once it gets up to the C um, control window, these monoclonal antibodies will be able to bind to it like this. So imagine once it's attached to it, it will activate the uh, dye. And because there's lots of it and they're very highly concentrated, you will find a line going across on the control window. It, that is to show that, yep, we've got monoclonal antibodies and it is working, it's mimicking as if there's XGG there, so therefore it forms a line there. Now, in the case of a woman is not pregnant, which means they do not have any XGG, because of the shape of the monoclonal antibodies, they are not going to be able to bind to it, so therefore there will be no pregnancy um, it being shown there if there's no binding of the uh, monoclonal antibodies and the XGG because they are there to recognize it. However, in the case of actual pregnancy, that means XGG is present, this is what then happens. First of all, the monoclonal antibodies will then also be able to bind to the XGG there because it's complementary shape. And after that, the XGG on the other end will be able to bind to any particular um, monoclonal antibody as well on the test strip. So it will look something like this. Now, because it's able to have the other end binding to that, there will also be uh, lots of monoclonal antibodies with the red dye concentrated onto this one here. So therefore we would see another line forming across the test strip if the XGG is actually present in the urine. So you can see in the case of no binding, there's no XGG, the monoclonal antibody will not be able to bind to it, so we will not see this line appearing. However, if XGG is present, it will bind to these antibodies there, but then those antibodies, uh, those that XGG will also be bound to another um, monoclonal antibody with the dye forming another red line there. So that's why we say double lines mean positive tests. So this is how um, pregnancy test works, but imagine we are designing it, we're changing it, and instead of targeting XGG, we make another monoclonal antibody that targets coronavirus antigens, and the same thing happens. We will have a mimic up in the control panel, that something that uh, has the similar shape to coronavirus antigen, and so therefore we can see the test is working, and then designing the antibodies to recognize specifically got a complementary shape 
to the antigens of a coronavirus and the same thing happens. Double lines means positive test. So if you're doing separate content, uh, that's what you need to know about monoclonal antibodies. Um, I actually went into quite a lot of detail uh, for this one um, and really because the reason being is if this comes up in an exam, it's really easy to get marks, to, to get four to five marks if you know exactly how monoclonal antibodies are actually made as long as you're using those keywords. The tricky thing is about pregnancy tests, so I would recommend go and doing a little bit more reading on this one uh, to go into details of that uh, in your own time. But that is the extra content for separate sciences in the case of preventing and treating diseases.